Hey everyone, Drive to School podcast, Pastor Goodman, Pastor Brademeyer. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm awesome. Thanks for asking. We uh, we get to talk more about philosophy today. You were uh, last time we we're going through some of the arguments that sort of show that there might just be a God out there, which which for us as Christians, kind of a big deal. So uh, I, I guess let's just kind of dive right back into it. We we sort of talked about last time the the unmoved mover, the the, the there's a beginning. Uh, what else can we learn? Well, there's you know, like I said in the last video, that Aquinas came up with five ways, and he didn't come up with all of these and. He just kind of, well, these are the classic five ways to do it. And I think that's where we really have to start. Because when you look at it, you know, in the history of philosophy, you interact with these five arguments. There are other arguments that have come out since then. There's developments of these. But these are kind of the basics, right? So we talked about the unmoved mover. The universe has a beginning. Motion exists. Something had to start that. And you're going to notice as we go through these, there's kind of a theme to all of these, right? That stuff is, and it had to come from somewhere, right? <laughs> so which I think is, a, is a, it's a basic observation. And I think most of us will, well, duh. Um, but it's something we sometimes take for granted in order to justify our false views of reality to keep our idols in place. And I think this is a very useful way to remind us that, look, just because you want reality to be a certain way doesn't mean it actually necessarily is. That's probably a really good approach to actually remembering inside of this, that, that what we are doing is not simply arguing philosophy or reason with somebody, but, but there's, there's a reason that they're holding to these beliefs. And it, it might be that um, if there were a God, it, it, might, it might change some of the things that they really don't want to have changed. And, and so this isn't just about being right. This is also about helping your neighbor. And, and so right. this, this might sort of put a, a big hole in how they want to look at the world. It might so a place for concern, for fear, for for doubt, for worry. And so for us, the answer for that isn't have the right answer, but it's that Jesus covers sin, death, and the power of the devil with his sacrifice on the cross. That the point of this isn't to win an argument, but to have something to hope in that's actually going to endure in this world. Well, and I think that's the big thing. When you talk to people about this stuff and you rock their world, you know, you crack their idols up a little bit and the foundation starts going out. They're going to get nervous. They're going to get worried. They're, they, you know, if they're honest with themselves, they, they might even feel like they're kind of falling, that they lose their place in the universe. And the solution to that is not, you know, beat them over the head with more logical proofs. The solution to that is, hey, let me tell you about this guy named Jesus who died for your sins, right? That, that's the solution. The gospel is the thing that actually gives us place in the universe. Right. And then the other thing that I'm glad that you hit on is something I have to remind myself of, and I try to remind my folks at my church of, is that when we talk to people about this stuff, if we're doing it to win, then we're not doing it for Jesus. And that's wrong. Because as soon as our neighbor becomes somebody that we can step on to make ourselves look better, then he stopped being our neighbor. And now he's an object for me to manipulate to make myself appear to be more righteous. And, you know, Jesus doesn't really think well of, of self-righteousness. No, I think there's a couple of warnings. Um, <laughs> all right. So with, with sort of that in mind, uh, let's, let's find reason number two. All right, so the second argument is the argument from universal causation. In other words, stuff happens. It happens for a reason. Okay. And it's just like with the first mover in motion, we have to go back to the beginning and say, well, if things happen and there's causes for things, then why does stuff happen at all? Because if everything has a cause, and remember when we say causes, we go back to our video last week, it's not a direct one-to-one -one necessary correlate correlation. Um, this is where, like, say, Richard Dawkins, he writes about this particular one in one of his books, and he completely misunderstands it because he sees causation as just a material thing makes another material thing makes another material thing. So when we use the word cause, we're talking about it broader than just apple seed makes apple tree makes apple makes more apple seeds and so on and so forth. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a broader category than that. But anyways, we have stuff. There are causes for it that has to come from somewhere. There has to be a first cause, just like there was a first mover. There has to be a first cause. And so what is that? Well, if that is something here in the universe with us, then nothing should exist because again, it's subject to the same rules of needing a cause itself. It has to be an uncaused cause, right? A cause that exists of its own accord. Um, and we would say that's God, right? That sets all this stuff in motion that begins the chain of causation that leads to where we are now. Can I ask a question? I, it, it might be a dumb one, so maybe it's a good thing I'm asking it. Um, <laughs> so when we talk about cause, and you said it's not simply like in terms of like chemical reactions or physical reactions, right. uh, but could we maybe even use the word will, like a, a desire um, that, that things would be set in motion, or is that maybe not quite right? Unpack that a little bit for me. 
So um, th th you said there is a reason for things. Um, and, and so like, if I drop a bowling ball, uh, the reason that my foot hurts is because of gravity. And I can right. sort of point to the, the physical reaction, but why would I drop the bowling ball? Like, what was the will behind that? Right. So in classical philosophy, that's not a problem because there's different senses of the word for cause, right? right. So, you know, you could have the, the material cause, the, the physical reason that you dropped the bowling balls, you got stung by a hornet, right? And, uh, you know, so you, there's different ways of using the word cause. And I just wanted to point out for the sake of discussion that when we talk about cause, we mean cause in the full sense, not just material thing leading to another material thing, but also things like the why and the purpose and you know, the form which things take, all of that are types of causality. Um, and so that's all part of that situation because, you know, all of these things have a, a existence, right? They all come from somewhere. And so it's not simply just that there's, you know, the, the hurt foot which came from the bowling ball, there's more to it than that. Reality is not quite that simple, right? And we sometimes try to make it that simple because it makes things easier to digest and work with. This yeah. is one of the things of modern science. We really try to boil stuff down to as few causes as possible, it's, it's a helpful thing. You know, there was a guy named William of Occam. He came up with something called Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is the best. That's true, except when the simple explanation is wrong, you know? And so it's a good for us to remember that when we talk about, you know, things having causes and beginnings, it's not just this physical thing, but it's also these other ways of talking about causes as well. Fair enough. All right. So there, there is a, a, a first cause. How do we start to chase that down? Well, it's the same kind of thing with the first mover, right? So you're here mm -hmm. and you came from somewhere and that would be your parents and your parents came from somewhere and we go back far enough and eventually we go, well, where did everything come from? So now we're back to the beginning of the universe. Mm -hmm. And again, we know the universe has a beginning because if it didn't have a beginning, it wouldn't exist, right? Um, so where did it come from? What set it in motion? And we get back to the same agent that we have already previously identified as the first mover which would we say would be the first cause or the uncaused cause, which okay. is kind of a trippy phrase, but you know, if everything has a cause outside of itself, something has to have its own causation, have its own being of its own accord. No, this actually makes sense to anybody who's ever spent more than 15 minutes with like a, a four-year-old who asks the question why to everything. So right. um, it, there's always another why, and they think it's hilarious, and I think <laughs> it's annoying. Uh, but I guess, you know, if I were to just talk with a four-year-old all day long and I somehow had that patience, maybe I'd actually get that far back. Right. And, and, and then, you know, usually people get annoyed well before that and then want to just jump to the beginning. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, this is why, by the way, everyone gets mad at philosophers and, uh, and the new atheists, too, because they, they all pursue that same line of reasoning. Well, why? Well, why? Well, why? Well, why? Well, why? You know, nothing He's grown up four-year-olds. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, Socrates, right? One of the father of modern Western philosophy, modern, not modern philosophy, but Western philosophy. Um, he was made to drink hemlock because he was annoying and went around and just bugged people with questions all the time. I mean, that's really why they killed him. They, his official charge was that he was promoting atheism. Um, but uh, really, it was because it was he was just obnoxious. annoying. It was just annoying. <laughs> it's a good warning for me, too. Um, so with that in mind, uh, what's the third one then? Well, the third one's very similar. And this okay. is the argument from contingency. And the second and third one, at least when I you know, talk about them with kids or, or people of my understanding or, you know, which is about the same, um, I like to kind of talk about them together because, you know, causes, that's a little abstract to us because the way that Aquinas talks about causes isn't the way that we do. But contingency makes sense, and they do go together in this way. So, like I already talked about the example of you know, Pastor Goodman came from his parents, who came from their parents, who came from their parents, so on and so on and so forth. And this is true of everything that you can see. I mean, look around you. There's every item, every object in the universe, everything that exists comes from somewhere else. We call these things contingent beings. Their existence depends on something outside of themselves, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So trace that back. If everything exists by the fact that it exists because of something else, why does anything exist at all? If there's an infinite regression, there shouldn't, there's no beginning, right? Then there should be nothing. But there is something. And so there has to be a different kind of being, something we call the essential being, a being that exists of its own accord, right? Something that causes itself to be, which, again, we would identify with God. And you can see how these first three arguments go together, right? Movement, causation, and being all tie together because they all do fit together in reality. And while we can distinguish for the purpose of making philosophical arguments, really we're talking about the same reality. And this is just, this is just three dimensions of that same fact that things exist and have motion and stuff happens in the universe.
Right. This started somewhere. And that our, ours is, you're right, I guess it's a simpler answer. Um, then somehow there, there were atoms and, and inorganic matter, rocks turned into organic matter, single cell organisms. And we don't know how, but it just, it, it did. So we, that has to start somewhere. And, and right. yeah, the answer to that really, really matters. Well, this is, this is one of the things that frustrates me about like Big Bang Theory. Because if you read the literature, and they may be re revising this because of some new observations they have with the new, you know, telescope, um, the was it the James Webb telescope? There, there's some weird observations they're getting out of this that don't match their predictions. But, anyways, um, so if you look at the the literature, you know, at least the older literature that I'm familiar with, um, everything in the universe was compressed into this little tiny ball of perfectly ordered matter about the size of a period on size twelve new uh, size twelve times new Roman font. And the only way all the matter of the universe could be compressed into that little tiny dot is if it was absolutely perfect. There could be no flaw in it because if there was a single electron or gluon or subatomic particle out of place, the whole thing would fly apart. Well, it did exist according to them and it blew up anyway, which is really fascinating because there's no possible reason that a static system like that should stop being static and start being dynamic. And, and which actually to me sounds more like a fall, you know, but instead of a creation event, but Weird. Um, it's like it's like the fall had repercussions through the whole universe or something. But anyways, and then, you know, and, and this is the thing I also tell my confirmation, because when we approach evolution, understand that it's not science in the way that chemistry is science. Right. It may be ha it may have some uh, empirical observation that they appeal to in it, but it is a religious myth. And so in the beginning, there was this perfectly dense, you know, perfectly ordered ball of matter. It blew up for no reason, started organizing itself for no reason and developing into more complex forms of matter and elements and so on and so forth. And then for no reason, it started making planets and having laws of gravity. And then you just go down the chain until eventually you get, you know, organic compounds that start living for some reason. And then despite the fact that they're all individual celled organisms, they start making multicellular organisms for no reason, you know, and it's just all this stuff happens and it's all completely arbitrary. And a lot of it violates what we do know about physics, which is kind of interesting too. And there's ways that they get around that with, you know, talking about the, the different conditions of the early universe and so on and so forth. But um, again, this is not observable. And so it's not science in the strict sense. It's more myth or empirical philosophy, you know, and which puts it on the same order as, as Genesis, actually. Right. It's narrative. It, everybody's telling themselves a story um, or, or being told a story. <laughs> right. And that matters. There, there's priests there, too. There's, there's people who, who sort of have the masters to uh, master knowledge to explain this to you. Right. They all have um, lab coats and glasses and carry around test tubes, right? <laughs> We have vestments, um, but but I get that it's sort of the same thing. Um, but so these are the questions then to ask. You know, are you are you telling yourself, or are you being told the right story? Uh, so what what about four? What's number four? Sorry about that. Um, oh, fine. oh come on, phone. All right, number four is uh, argument from degree, and this one's a little bit more complicated. But the idea is is that we can conceive of things by degree. So something is beautiful. There's something that's more beautiful than that. There's something even more beautiful than that, which implies that there's both something that is perfectly unbeautiful and something mm. which is perfectly beautiful because that gives us a frame of reference for the lesser or greater comparison. Sure. And so the degrees ultimately have to come to a place where there's a complete beauty, right? A full beauty, a full good, whatever you want to call it, a full perfection, and whatever that thing is, is beyond what we see in this universe. And yet we all can conceive of it. We know that it exists. We operate as if it exists in the way that we make these comparisons. And that thing we would say is God. You know, he's, he is the way, the truth, and the life. I think I read that somewhere one time. <laughs> that sounds familiar. You're right. We, we operate like it. I, I never even really thought about it. But we, we, we sort of always, you know, we're told there's always going to be somebody better out there. Um, and so we can do it with basketball. And so we can say, who's the greatest basketball player alive today? And so we can say, who is better in, in which generation? So MJ or LeBron. And we can have this, this big discussion. Uh, but even then, we, we sort of operate as one day there will be somebody better still. And there will, there's always going to be a better but what's a best look like? We operate as if there actually is a best, even though we're never going to get there because there's something different than us. Right. And by the way, the answer to your question is MJ is the best. That's just, he's, he's the greatest. LeBron can't hold a, hold a candle to MJ. It's just the way it is. I was born in Cleveland and I can't even <laughs> entirely disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, right. that's the problem, right? With, when it comes to comparisons, it always assumes a frame of reference that is objective. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is one of the things that really distresses me about modern society is we have taken goodness and perfection 
and beauty. And because we tend to relate to them in terms of better or worse, um, we say it's all subjective, right? So beauty doesn't have an objective quality to it. We just say it's whatever, you know, whatever is your taste, that's, that's beautiful to you, which um, the Christian church would not agree with, you know, through her history, right? That which is most beautiful is, is the beatific vision. You know, it's God himself and being in his presence because beauty has an attractive quality. And what's the most attractive thing in the universe? Well, God, ultimately. I, we, in society, that we've confused beauty and lust in, in a lot of ways because lust gets right. to be very subjective. Um, and, and then lust gets to be sort of ripped away from a standard. In fact, it's the opposite of a standard that is, you know, the sixth commandment in marriage. Um, but, but I can find beauty in, in something, again, that has to come from outside of me. Inside of me, you're right. It's always going to be bent a certain direction mm -hmm. um but yeah we, we actually want to start with again something different which is for us again god right you know that's the thing it's just one of those things that drives me crazy because we've forgotten beauty and you can see it in every building that was built in the 1950s and 60s they're all big square boxy monstrosities dehumanizing you know they're ugly and uh and then we justify it by saying well they're practical except they're all falling apart now so they're really not that practical you can go to Europe and see really beautiful buildings that have been around for longer than our countries existed, but we can't do that because that's impractical. You know, it just, it's so bizarre, the things that we tell ourselves and it ultimately goes to just denying reality and trying to shoehorn ourselves into reality of our own making. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> all right. One more. We got one more there. I got a lot to chew on already, but, but give me the last one. So the last one is the argument from final cause or the teleological argument. And this is, this one's a little bit harder for people who are not Christian to get their minds around, but it seems to be the case that things have a purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Trees do stuff, don't they? They they make oxygen, they grow leaves, they produce fruit or nuts or whatever, right? They, they have a purpose. They have something that it seems to be the case that they are supposed to do. They have a final fulfillment in something. Well, if that's the case, then that assumes that there is, in fact, somebody who coordinates and who assigns these purposes, Right. And we have to be careful here because it's easy when we talk about this to sound like we're making an argument from design, that the universe appears to be designed a certain way. And that is a variation of this argument. Um, but it's, I think the teleological argument is actually the stronger version of it, but we don't need to get into that. And, uh, but anyways, the purpose is, uh, point is, is that these things all have a purpose. You know, they all have some final form that there's something that they function to do. You know, so like, um, you know, think about the things we make. Books do something. Right. And we can tell whether a book's doing its job or not based on whether it's doing what a book ought to do, which is to be written legibly so I can understand what the author's trying to communicate to me. Right. And if it doesn't do that, then it's a bad book. Or if the binding falls apart and I can't actually pick it up and read, it's a bad book. Well, that seems to also be the case in nature. Right. If the mountain is hanging out there being a mountain and it's pretty and mountainy, well, then it's doing its job. And if it decides to tip over one day and fill in the valley, that's not a very good mountain. Right? It's not a very know. mountainous mountain, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is, it is, again, this is hard for my inner idolatry because the idea that I would tell the mountain that it's being a bad mountain seems foolish, but at the end, that, that's because I'm the one that wants to set all the standards and I'm also the one that wants to correct them um, right. as if I want to be like God. <laughs> I think I read that somewhere too once. <laughs> Right. Okay. So if we're willing to sort of start out with this, it's not just you that can create things for a purpose out of, out of creation, but, but in fact that creation itself might have sort of a driving desire or force um, or, or, right. yeah. Right. And, and this, like I said, this one's really hard for people to, to wrap their minds around because for all of us who, who believe in God and believe that he made the universe, it is natural for us to see them as having purposes or ends, you know, mm -hmm. that there's some reason that they exist, right? There's not a reasonlessness to it. And the problem is, though, with this one is when you talk to atheists, they have already assumed, as, as the philosophers would say a priori, by, by their basic assumption about reality, that there is no reason. And so if you come along and say, well, there's a reason for this stuff, they're going to roll their eyes and say, well, that's because you're stupid and you don't know any better, because clearly there is no reason. And that's just the way it is. And um, this one is a lot harder to, I think, actually talk about with people who aren't, at least in some way, uh, theists. You know, it makes sense from our worldview, but it doesn't make sense, I think, from from other people's worldview. And this one routinely gets kind of picked apart by um, theologians and, and academicians, and especially those who are outside of the Christian faith. Right. But I mean, at the same time, you can sort of start even just by saying, do you think that you are the biggest 
force in the universe today, that you are the, the smartest thing that is out there right now? Or do you think that maybe something somewhere out there might be bigger and smarter than you and also have a, a will or a purpose? And, and, you know, you can do this uh, with aliens or you can do this with, with any real force that you want. Um, but there, there's, it feels like there should be something bigger than me out there. If I am all that there is, the universe is a sad and lonely place. <laughs> Well, that's true. At least, you know, MJ is right though. So there we go. <laughs> but all you know, right. this, this is, this is the, you know, this is the thing though about all this that just really drives me crazy because you, you know, the hoops that people jump through to try to explain that everything in the universe seems to have a purpose. Um, you know, right now it's in vogue to talk about how aliens came here and like started stuff, or there's a, a bunch of uh, st- uh, people that have been out in the media lately talking about how it seems like we live in a computer simulation. You know, because all the data seems to indicate that there's a design and a purpose to this. Well, I mean, which is the more logical explanation that we're all a computer program or that there's a God? I mean, it's a little ridiculous, isn't it? That the lengths we'll go to to deny the existence of the creator is, is a fascinating thing to me. Well, it's, it's a lot of where you're starting from, too, because like starting from down here, I can go over there. That's my computer. I can point to a computer and say, well, maybe there's a bigger computer. But, but again, you have to start from outside of yourself from from on high right well and this is the problem too with the you know in 1650 a guy named uh, Rene Descartes wrote a book called meditations on first philosophy and he kind of inverts the traditional philosophical method up to that point is the world is the real thing I'm going to figure it out he inverts that to say I'm the most real thing and I have to figure out how to get out of myself to the world and we've been doing that ever since and that's just our assumption is that I'm the most real and my experience then becomes normative and so whatever I experience or think or whatever becomes the thing that's most real. And for us Christians, of course, that which is most real is Christ. And so that immediately decenters us as the, as the foundation of reality and the foundation of knowledge and the foundation of truth and the foundation of beauty and everything else, right? And uh, this is a hard thing for people who aren't in that worldview to get. Wow. No, that's, that's brilliant. And we just did metaphysics. Well, somewhat. <laughs> I'm going to count it anyway. Thanks for joining us, Pastor. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>